So you've got your second page there. As hopefully you're starting to get familiar with by now, or not starting, well and truly, uh, there are two pages that are relevant to the mathematics, so the two unit course. And then the last page is the extension one page. So I just want to point this out for you right now because, oh look, all of this stuff that you now actually know about. Now just have a look under integrals, right? We know what integrals are. We've been using this language for a while now. How many of those integrals have we actually dealt with in class? Underneath that direct heading, it's just the top one. That's it. We haven't touched the integration or differentiation of exponential functions, log functions, all of this is trig, okay? But then after that, oh, you should recognize this, right? We've done this this week. So what are these things? The giveaway are those squiggly equal signs, right? So we can use the trapezoidal rule or Simpson's rule to approximate any integral we like. Not a trick question, even though it's straightforward. What does the trapezoidal rule use? What kind of shape does it use to approximate an area? What does it use? It uses a trapezium, right? Now, more tricky question, less trivial. What shape does Simpson's rule use? It uses a parabola, which is why you get so much more accuracy, because of course parabolas can be curved, right? Now, don't forget, what that means is you can approximate any integral with these, and we know some integrals to do with, say, volumes, right? Now, a, a classic sort of harder to question is approximating a volume using trapezoidal rule. And a lot of people's brains just kind of fizzle out because they're like, huh? It's a, this is a volume. How do, you, how do you use one of these, right? Well, it will do any integral, including one that comes from a volume, okay? All right, now, I just want to point out, good, we know some integral stuff here, but interestingly, the thing I want to highlight today is not on the integrals. It's over here on the last page under binomial theorem, okay? Now, binomial theorem, we looked at this pretty early last year. I'd like you with me to write down, you see there's three things in this inequality, three things that are all equal to each other. Um, what's the difference between the second and the third thing? Have a look at them closely. What's the difference? Yeah, the powers have been switched around, which is their way of saying, you know how this is going to be from Pascal's triangle, right? Well, Pascal's triangle, just like a binomial expansion, is symmetrical, okay? So it doesn't ma matter if you start with the A's as bigger numbers and the B's as smaller numbers, or other way around, you'll get the same expansion either way, okay? The, for the purposes of what we want to do now, I just want you to write the first two. Can you write this part of the equation? And then we're going to talk about it. Okay, now, if you have another color there, that will be handy. I'm going to steal this now, don't need it. Okay. Right. How many look at this thing? I wonder if you've gotten to the point now where, unlike when you first looked at it and you thought, oh my goodness, what is this thing? I wonder if you've gotten to the point where you can tell me about every single symbol on this, pit, on this you know, equation and say, I know exactly what each of these means. I think you should be there. Let me help you remember, okay? What is this thing over here on the left-hand side? This A plus B, we have a special name for this. We call it a, it's got two things. We call this a binomial, right? It's not just any sum. It's a two, two term sum, so it's a binomial. When you raise it to a power, it'll expand out to this long, awful thing, right? So rather than write out the whole long, awful thing, each of the terms that you get is quite similar. There's a term you get from NCK notation with all the factorials and stuff inside that. There's a term with the A's, and then there's a term with the B's, yeah? When you have a look at these powers, one of these powers is climbing up, and one of them is climbing down, yeah? And eventually they swap places. Now, the thing I want you to focus on is this, this guy here. This itself also has its own name. What's it called? This is called sigma notation, right? Named after the Greek letter that it's in, okay? Now, when sigma notation was invented, okay, people thought really carefully about what should go into it, because it's kind of, doesn't really look like anything else that we've ever used, right? Now, particularly, I want to ask two questions of sigma notation. Firstly, 
Why is that there? K equals. It's not a rhetorical question. It put yourself in the position of the people who are inventing some notation to try and write this thing out, but not write out the whole long thing, because mathematicians are famously lazy. Why do we put K equals there? Hmm. Now we have seen like limit notation go underneath things like this, like limit as n approaches infinity, or as x equals zero, or something like that. But this is something quite different, isn't it? What might be lost if I didn't have the k equals there? What might be lost? Hmm. I always laugh when people are like, oh, maths is all about numbers. There are no numbers on the board, right? You're like, oh, wow. Wait, look, there it is. There's one number, okay? Now, you've got to work out where that number is going to go. You've got to work out where zero goes, and one, and two, and three, and then all the way up to n, okay? But without anything here, where is it going to go? Like, you've got so many pronumerals here to choose from, there's not a clear explanation of where it goes. And so we say k equals, or r equals, or x equals, in order to tell you, well, when you change the number, where is that going to go into? It goes into here, here, and here, and not any of the other pronumerals. Does that make sense? Okay, now I'm going to ask the question in reverse. We've got k equals down the bottom. But there's no k equals up the top. Not a rhetorical question. Why not? Like, if we bothered to put it down the bottom, why haven't we put it at the top also? Because they're both about the same thing. Say that again, Paul? Kind of redundant, right? Redundant means like it's not necessary. You don't get any extra information by saying k equals zero down here and k equals n up there. Because if you started putting numbers into k, you're just going to keep on doing it into k. It doesn't change, right? So that's why this notation is trying to be as bare as possible and put down the, the minimum amount of information required. Okay? Now the reason why I'm highlighting that is because when you have a look at something like this, yeah. You can write this down if you like. The integral notation is clearly related to sigma notation, right? Clearly related. Uh, in fact, they probably would have used the sigma if it hadn't been taken already. Because what they're doing is they're summing, right? They're adding things up. Now, it's clearly related because number one, it's the same letter, just a different language, alphabet. But secondly, do you see how the thing that we've been focusing on here, it appears here as well. It means something a little bit different. Like here, it's just whole numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Here, it's like 3 and 3.1 and 3.2 and all the infinite number of real numbers in between, right? But it's the same idea for start here and end here, yeah? So I hope you see the parallel. 